Awesome. So why don't we get started, and now when anybody comes in late, you can all tell that those people how awesome the first five minutes of the presentation was. Oh. So just remember to repeat any questions you get for Re the live streamer. Sure. Okay, fair enough. Um, just remember, the first five minutes of presentation, you've never heard anything that good. You tell that to anybody that comes in late. So anyway, this is a class uh, I, uh, it's called Teaching uh, Pearl for Advocacy and, and Fun. And uh, I, I, I taught a class uh, in, for, for Pearl Beginners last end of last year. And uh, I taught the class because I really believe that uh, Pearl is a great language. And it's, if we would manage to be able to communicate the value of Pearl better, we not only bring more people to the language, uh, which, was, which is good for all of us, and those new people would come in with all their great ideas and make Pearl even better for the next group of people coming in. And uh, I try to blog about it and uh, do CPA modules and educate. Um, and uh, finally, I just, you know, we always keep talking about, hey, we should, teach, we should do more teaching. We should do more teaching. Well, okay, I'm going to teach. So I taught a class. And uh, I just give a quick couple call-outs. I, I want to thank my company, Shutterstock, uh, all the images, with the exception of two, which I will point out uh, in this presentation, are from our, our collection um, of images. And uh, also, we're hiring. Uh, I'm being asked to say that. So that's jobs MHTML. So that tells you we're using Pro, right? I also want to give a shout out to General Assembly. That's the, the uh, place where I taught the class. I appreciate them giving me a space and uh, helping me with advertising and getting people to come in and, and all that. So that was really great. Uh, go check out their website. I also, a couple more shout outs. Uh, I, I appreciate Chromatic uh, and the Community for Modern Pearl, the book. Uh, my students used it. It was great that it was free in EPUB. And they were so excited to see it on GitHub and to know that it was a collaborative project. It's just one of those things that makes Pearl look like a really modern happening place and not just uh, stuff that people write crappy admin scripts in. Um, and uh, also just the Pearl Org community in general uh, for doing so much over the last few years to get to the point where I could actually teach this class and not be completely like on my own from top to bottom in, in how to teach Pearl. Okay, so end of the love fest. Um, let's hear it. What sucks about Pearl? Don't be shy. Access. Keep going. No other implementations. No other <laughs> implementations. Come on. Ow. Come on. Keep going. I'm serious. All right. Let's move. hear more. more. Tool chain. Pearl 6. Okay, uh, so you, somebody said Pearl 6, per, uh, the P5P channel, uh, the XS components. What else? Version numbers. Version numbers. Uh, not enough people working. Ow. Okay. More. I'm sorry? Python. All right. So no good grammars. I'm sorry, what? Uh, let's not name people. Okay, come on. No one uses it. Okay. It doesn't run on my computer. It doesn't run on Windows. Okay. It doesn't run on my Oh, my computer, period. Ow. Or it does. It's not good for mobile. You guys are great. You came up with more, more things than my students did. Um, so I started my first class that way. I, the only difference is I actually had a board, and, I, and when they shouted out, they had to go up and write uh, down what they wanted and, you know, what they were thinking. And... Uh, you know, why did I start my first class that way? It, it's Sure, it's, it's a little amusing, but uh, I have a kind of a point to it. Um, I, I believe if you're going to teach, you need to understand where somebody is coming from. You can't just, like, pour stuff into them. You've got to know what they're thinking. And I really wanted to get at their ideas. What, when I say Pearl, like, they came to the class, so they must be interested for some reason. But they've they got to have some lurking hesitancies and if I'm going to teach Perl, I need to know what those are because the class has to be about that. I don't believe that teaching is about just pouring stuff into people's heads. That's not teaching. I think teaching is about inspiring people. And when I say, for me, what is inspiration is I do something and somebody else, they hear what I'm saying and they form their own feeling about it. Now, they're not going to form the exact same thing in my head. Like, I can't take what's in my head and put it in, into their heads. But I can, like, communicate something in such a way that gets them to create their own cool ideas about what we're talking about. And it's something that's meaningful to themselves within their own life context, within their own problem context. And I think that for me, teaching is about that. And I think Perl is a really fantastic language for working on problems because it's a language that help, that really does get contextual and can work with a lot of different viewpoints. So I think it's, like, for me by feeling about teaching, really connect strongly with why I like being a pro programmer. 
So I was saying, like, I think I need to inspire people to create their own ideas. And they help them to form those ideas into something real. And then, of course, along the way, I want to make sure that I help guide them so that as they try to make their idea real in the world, we don't create a, a big mess to get it to actually work. So I could, as, as, as part of being a teacher, you want to inspire and you want to give a little mentoring, a little guidance so that they just don't get so far off the path that it's a lot of unlearning or they, they write a lot of like, well, what we would call like messy code, right? So how do I, I go about doing that? I think for inspiration, I think you've got to surprise people from time to time um, because they might be like, wow, I didn't know you could do that with Perl. Uh, I didn't. I think it's good to help people connect things. Uh, People remember things better when they're connected. Like the ancient Greeks, whenever they would go memorize like speeches um, because they didn't have teleprompters, right? So they would have to memorize a speech, and the way they did it is they would, uh, they would all, like as part of their education and, and being a debater, they would stare at like a wall, and they would memorize the, each crack, and how each crack connected to like a spot on the wall, and that spot connected to a piece of graffiti. And they would memorize that entire string, and when they went to go work on their speech, because they had that like whole like big idea, like, picture in their head, they could put their different points at, in each one of those spots. And then that helped them to remember. And I think that like learning is that way. Is You just can't throw out like, a bunch of stuff at the wall. People are going to tune out. They're going to forget it. It's better to throw out a couple ideas and show how each idea is connected as you move along because people will remember that. And I also think you need to like show those connections very carefully. So like you start with a simple idea. And then you teach them something new, and you say, okay, what I'm teaching you now is a little like what I just taught you, but here's the little twist, right? And then you go on to the third thing. It's just like what I just taught you, but here's another little twist. That way people, again, they remember it. They see the connections. So you get the inspiration. You get the surprise, and you move things along. So uh, just a, a, a little divergence. I added this slide based on, on our, our keynote. Um, and who recognizes this? Raise your hand. Okay, so keep them, up, keep them up, keep them up. I didn't say put them down. Can you, those of you who got your hands up, can you look around the room and, and see like the number? Of, okay, there are a couple people that did not raise their hands, right? Okay, so, okay, you can put them down now. Oh, I'm sorry, well, keep them up for a second. If you've seen the movie more than once, all right, more than, more than 10 times, uh, I just wanted to know. Okay, you can put it down. <laughs> to, all right, so, I'm sorry, what? Can you taunt me now? No, no, no. You can taunt me after the presentation on IRC because I'm going to be gone. Um, okay, so for, for those of you who don't know, like, I mean, uh, this is a movie by Monty Python, and uh, amongst people who are programmers, uh, particularly from a very specific context, uh, these are, happen to be movies that we've watched. And a lot of us have watched. In fact, most of us. Probably 10 years ago, everyone would have raised their hands. Okay. This year, a couple people didn't raise their hands. I want to point out to all of you here, 10 years from now, the number of hands are going to be a lot lower. Okay? And so I guess what I'm trying to get at here is when you're teaching, you have to think hard about the context in which you're, how you're communicating your ideas. Because if you're, all you're talking about is Monty Python, that's going to fly today, but it's not going to fly tomorrow. And it's also going to cut out a lot of people that don't come from the same like, specific Western cultural context that we have. And that's like a humongous part of the world. In fact, it's the majority of the world. Um, and I also, you know, just again, playing, playing from uh, some of the thoughts uh, from our keynote, you know, if all your, um, if all your examples are like Jack and Jill, Srinivas is not going to, like, feel good. Okay, so just please keep that in mind as a teacher. You know, you, I understand you want to play, and you know, sometimes people when they're teaching, they, they want to act like they're cool, so they, they'll pull out, like, popular stuff. Just think a little bit about it, you know, because you might be referring to, like, context and giving examples that, that may not be fully understood by everybody in your audience and, and might feel a little bit hostile. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Anyway, no more lecturing. So let's get to the fun part. So um, first class, um, again, I say, like I said, I don't actually think I can actually teach people anything, but I, maybe I can inspire people. And so that's why I want the first class to be very fun. So for a good part of the rest of this presentation, I want to just give you a quick summary of what I did in the first class, and then I'll, I'll give you a sort of a summary of what we did afterwards and, and how it ended. Um, so just to give you an idea of what I mean, what for me is fun and what for me I, what I hope is inspiring. And I hope that there are some things here that are a little surprising to you uh, as things that you that should be taught in a, in a beginner pro class on day one. So um, baby talk. I remember when I first started using Perl, 
the, one of the things that I, I had heard was that Perl is a language that you could be you could do something useful and competent even if you knew very little. In other words, you could actually get a lot done in Baby Talk Perl. And I think that's pretty cool. And that's something that I communicate to my students that it's it's fine to just like to work to play with the language. Um, children don't learn to talk perfectly. They learn to talk because they're willing to play with words and sounds, right? So like let's let's like make sure that when we are seeing people and they're starting off with their baby talk pearl, you know, help correct them, uh, but you know, don't like shut them down because that's where they're starting from. And it's just a great thing about our language that you can that you can be that way. Like other languages you can't baby baby talk Python? No. Okay, right? I'm sorry, what was that? That's most of Python. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's not get into language debates. Okay. So I start this was the first thing that I showed them. Um, because Perl starts at the command line, right? And um, I know there might be a few things in here that might be a little controversial, but I just chose stuff that I thought was, was decent to begin with. Uh, so I, I taught people, uh, you know, this is a command line application, and I actually ran it uh, so they could see that uh, I would type in my name, and bang, it would say, hello, my name. So in other words, it, it demonstrated, and although this is a very simple application, I think it actually demonstrates a lot. It demonstrates stuff about standard input and standard output, and it, it, it talks about how to use a Perl module, and there's, it's a basic script. I mean, there's a lot going on in here, and I could probably spend the whole rest of this talk just talking about this. Um, of course, when they saw it, they were a little like scared, uh, so this was the reaction, and uh, that's why I went through and I probably spent a good 20 minutes just like line by line or character by character basically explaining what that was. I talked about that Perl was a command interpreter. What, is, what does that mean? I got a little bit into what does it mean to be a dynamic language. Um, I answered questions about that. People asked me, like, what's the difference between, like, a, you know, to Java and other things. So it was great. People like spawned off thoughts and we just even just went on about that. I talked about the command line switches you get with Perl. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the module. There was that modern Perl, that M modern Perl. What does that mean? It means where that Perl is a modular language. That's one of the greatest things about Perl is that we have this massive like open source repository and you can just grab stuff. And I spent a lot of time talking about standard input and standard output because for me, uh, standard in, standard out, uh, that's one of those things that I said before about like you start with the basic concept and you build upon it as you go through your slides, you go through your thing. Standard input and standard output is like a basic concept that programs use. And it's interpreted and used in different ways. It's used one way from a command line. And it's a little bit different when you get to a, a, a web server. But in general, this, they're similar enough that if you understand one, then you can migrate up to understanding the next piece later on. Uh, I also got a chance to talk a little bit about implicit arguments. I was really freaking nervous about implicit arguments, like, you know, the... Uh, the add underscore stuff. Um, I thought that that, that was going to be something the students had a lot of trouble with and would get confused about. So I probably talked about that a lot. Um, as it turned out, it was one of the things they loved. So that surprised me. Um, so then anyway, um, I took that and I said, okay, that's great. We have a one-liner. And if that's all the Perl you ever do and it's useful to you, that's awesome. But if you want to take it to the next level, let's write it as a script. So I took the same thing and I wrote it as a script. Basically, so and I got a chance to talk about what this meant, what the what the shebang was, and and how that was put together. I spent a few minutes saying you might see you might see some shebang uh, with user bin Perl as opposed to user bin M Perl, and kind of said you should do it this way and, and why, uh, and uh, a little bit about again implicit arguments, and now that got put together. Uh, I mentioned modern Perl. I know that may not be. Uh, again, that may be amongst this group, maybe one of the more controversial concepts. But what I wanted was is an easy way for people who are coming to Perl to activate like a modern Perl environment. And uh, maybe there's a better option now. Uh, but uh, back in November, I, I seemed to me like one of the better ones uh, to make sure the strict and warnings and all those basic things were put into place. So, you know, you could all hit me up later with your better ideas about it. But it was easy for them to remember because I called the class Modern Perl. So I said, use Modern Perl. They even thought I wrote it, which I didn't. I didn't correct them. Um, <laughs> although afterwards, they, I showed them the C pan, they found out that I didn't write it. Um, so then here, I ran the script. And again, I did it interactively. And you know, for the, and for the purposes of saving a little time, I won't keep jumping back and forth to a term. But I'm sure you can all imagine your head, right, what, how that would work. They were happy to see that. So we, we, got a, we went from the uh, command line. We wrote it as a script. OK, let's bump it up a notch. OK, now. I'm teaching Moose and objects in, in the very first Perl class, okay? 
I think, and I was a little, again, this is something I was nervous about. I thought maybe they would have trouble. But actually, they understood most of this right off the top. And it looked really cool. Like, people were immediately, there were two people in the class that actually had heard of Moose already. as something that was cool about Pearl. And we ended up talking about objects. So I spent a few moments explaining what objects are. And I just gave them the simple, simple concept. It's that objects are data with some behaviors wrapped around them. And we do that because it makes it so that you, you can hide the way the data works and you can change implementation uh, without breaking all your code. And it's, it's a fundamental unit of code reusability in modern programming. And I just stopped there. You can continue to argue about it. You can say functional programming is better. I don't, but for the purpose of the class, it worked for them. And like I said, you know, if you're saying use Moose, you don't need to say use Monopro because use Moose turns the same thing on, which we all know it doesn't do exactly the same thing, but it does enough of the same thing that I could say that. Uh, and they understood what attributes were um, and uh, obviously required and the read, uh, RO read only. That's, once I explained it, it jumped right out. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, uh, subroutines. Uh, most of the people in the class, even though they had not used Perl, they had done a little bit of programming, so the concept of a subroutine was already something they knew. And they would known a little bit about objects from other programs, programming languages. So I w they weren't complete programming newbies in my class, so that did help me a little bit. But um, I, I went right to it with the object because I thought that it was uh, important to get people, like I said, I, I, I want people to get the idea, but I want to get them going right from the beginning. And even though there's a lot of stuff here that they may not fully get, it's enough like what I just showed them that they could see the connection, okay? And, you know, how would we use it? I say, well, when you write something as a, as a class, now you can reuse it. Unlike a script, it can only do one thing. Once you've written it as a class, you could use it in multiple contexts. So here's a script that uses what we just did and, and works basically the same way as the script we just did five minutes or ten minutes earlier, but it's now as a, as a class, so it's now reusable. Everybody thought that was awesome. Okay, even though it's a little more code, but they could see the advantage. And uh, also at this point, uh, there were people in the class who were like, wow, Mo you know, uh, Moose and, and Perl, the language, it looks, it looks more attractive than I have been led to believe. <laughs> so um, I, I, I think it looks nice, but uh, I know people have different feelings. Um, anyway. And so anyway, we were, you know, again, we ran it and it worked the same way. Um, again, I'm t I wanted to teach... Uh, objects right off the top because I wanted people to have a concept of building blocks. One of the most important parts of Perl is that we encourage people to think of your applications as CPAN modules, whether you're going to put them on CPAN or not. You should write your applications that way as reusable bits of stuff, okay? And so think about building blocks right from the beginning. And if you don't totally get objects, you can cargo cult a lot of stuff and actually maybe talk your way through a lot of it as well. Um, so this is uh, the first slide um, that Shutterstock didn't uh, I probably shouldn't show it. I don't have copyright to this, but uh, oh, you can't read that, can you? It says those were the droids you were looking for. If you can't see it now, I, I, I guess I probably shouldn't be using a Star Wars thing because, but I guess it's pretty well known in the world, right? Um, I, I don't want my students to regret later on <laughs> that they, when they write a lot of code and they're, they're down the path and they've probably written, you know, maybe a couple thousands of lines of code, if they haven't been given like the right conceptual tools, they will written a big mess and then they're going to be regretful. Anyway, um, another thing that was great about writing stuff as, as a class is that, wow, oh, now you can write a test case. So I taught them test cases in class one. Um, and again, there were some things here they hadn't seen before, but basic Perl testing is pretty simple, really. You know, I got an opportunity to talk a little bit about the package names, and you know, when you want to use something, you say, use it. All right, that's pretty obvious. And uh, test, the test cases are assertions. Um, in this case, I'm saying is something something. That was also pretty understandable to them. And this was a great opportunity to step back and say, hey, you wrote something as a class, as a reusable piece of stuff. You were able to use it for your script, and now you can also write a test case for it. Okay, so that was also, in other words, you could write better code right from the beginning if you do it that way. Um, and they, they liked it in general. They, they liked the idea, um, how that went together. And I showed them how the test case run from the command line. Then again, I wanted to bump it up one level. Got the same class. Let's write a website. I asked everybody in the room who had written a website before. And in Perl, nobody, of course, nobody rose their hand with that. And so I showed them Plaq. Um, and I'm going to assume most of us in this room here are familiar enough with Plaq that this will be meaningful to them, to all of you. But uh, uh, they were psyched that you could write a Perl website in a few lines of code. Like, 
somebody in the class actually said, I mean, I don't, I'm paraphrasing it, I don't have to spend three days compiling Apache and Mod Perl to be able to like write applications for, 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 for Perl that sit on the web? And I said, no, all you need to do is, is return a, a subref, okay? I didn't call it that. I said, it has to look like this. <laughs> and this has to be the thing at the end. Um, and then later on when we talked about web development, I, I talked about anonymous subrevs and so forth. Um, and uh, I said, hey, here you go. You got your, you know, that same class that we wrote earlier on. Now we're going to repurpose it yet again. We use it as a script. We put in a test case. Now we're going to put it on the Internet, okay? Um, and I spent a moment just talking about what Plaque was and how simple it is. And this was also a great opportunity to talk about standard input and standard output for the web because, you know, you can think of, of HTTP in a standard input, standard output manner. The only thing you need to think about is that with the web, you have the HTTP header, so that's a little bit of additional metadata. So that's sort of how I explained it. I said it's just the same thing except there's a little bit of extra stuff there, we, you know, metadata stuff, and they're, think of them as almost two separate parts of the, of the message, right? And uh, so they were able to build upon what I taught them about standard input and standard output from the script example and bring that over to the Internet. Um, and then so, you know, we started up the application. I think I have it running here. Let's see. Oh, oh no, I got that one running. Sorry. Um, at this point, they noticed that uh, I was using PlackUp as opposed to Perl. And they were like, how come you didn't use Perl? And so I stopped and explained what PlackUp was as basically a wrapper around the Perl interpreter that created a web context. I didn't say anything more than that. And I got the opportunity to talk to them about Perl doc. And or they go to MetaCP and look up stuff. So if you, if you ran into anything about Perl that, that you wanted to know about, here are the two resources that Perl programmers generally use in order to find out the answers to those. And they all wrote down metacpan.org so to go look up things. Um, so that worked out pretty well. And, okay, here's the running website. It would look like this. Okay. At the end of the first class, um, I, wanted, I knew that there were a lot of people that were auditing the class. Um, they don't always, they only signed up for class one. They only paid for one class. So on the assumption that people might not come back, I, I spent the last chunk of the class talking about where they could go to learn more. Um, I pointed them at the, at the Modern Pearl book. I talked about Task Kensho. Anybody know what Task Kensho is? Uh, you, you know what it is. Stand up and tell people. Okay. Uh, just simply Task Kensho is, I, I, what, the way I described it is, uh, a bunch of modules. We know that in, on CPAN there's a lot of different ways to do things. Um, Task Kensho is, is an attempt to write down ways to do common things like build web applications and send emails that you probably won't get laughed at if you used. Okay. Uh, but there may be other options. You may find things you like better. But if you use those things, no one's going to say you're stupid. Um, and I pointed them at Perl.org. Um, I, I gave them a list of additional books and uh, talked about IRC. Um, I, I said that although there are a lot of mailing lists, for better or worse, the Perl community seems to use IRC mostly uh, for, 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 for talking and so forth, and that I encourage them to go there and, and, to, uh, and to, be, you know, to become part of it. So that was sort of the, the end of the first class. Um, for the remaining classes, I tried to, to build upon that. Uh, I, I talked about, in the second class, I talked about Perl history, and I spent time teaching people how to install Perl. Um, I then taught a class on what I thought of as the minimum, like, syntax you needed to know. Uh, I actually did teach them more Perl than I knew in one of my first paying job. Uh, I, at my first paying job, I didn't actually even know how to write a Perl subroutine, so I taught them how to write subs. They already, already knew it, but um, so I taught them basic, basic syntax, you know, different kind of variable constructs, there's between a hash and, a, and an array, and how they're similar in some ways and different in other ways, and I gave them a lot of examples. Uh, and then I went on, and we went, we went on to build a, an application. We started building an application that we then stuck with building that application for the rest of the class. I think that worked really well because it provided a sort of continuity from that class going forward. Um, I basically, I, I started with, uh, who here is interviewed at, at Shutterstock? Did I, I didn't interview you, did I? I, when, I, I, when I interview at Shutterstock, I give a, a, a kind of a quiz to people uh, to build a small application. So we basically built that application. 
together. And we kind of grew it over time, and we worked on it, and we tried to, to make it better and to make it follow community standards. Um, I did a, a class on the most common solutions or commonly accepted solutions to common problems, like you know, opening, uh, opening files and parsing and parsing CVS data and you know, scraping stuff from the Internet. And I introduced uh, DBI, and I talked about a little bit about DBX class as well. Um, just to talk about databases, you know, so I went through those things and I gave them it was kind of a whirlwind tour um, It might have been actually one of the le less successful classes because I think I covered too much uh, I did spend an entire class eventually talking about objects um, But within the context of the application that we were writing together uh, And I the last the the seventh class we just was like a workshop We just all played with the little app and I, I kind of challenged everybody to to make you know weird different things with it to see what they come up with um, I spent the last class talking about all the stuff that they shouldn't do, uh, that they'll probably see in code they have to work on and get paid for. Um, so that was also, I just wanted them, you know, I wanted them to know, like, they're going to see, you know, bare file handles, and they're going to see, like, a lot of, like, you know, bad use of eval. They're going to see that. If they get jobs in Perl, they're going to see some of that crappy code, and they have to know what it is, and they need to be able to at least talk about it intelligently. Um, Let's, I, I just want to say that I had a, a guest lecturer in the class on, on Tess Kensho. Um, he's sitting over here. We can all point at him. Everybody point at him. It worked, really, it worked out really well. It was serendipitous, but it, it was just like, it was great to have a good guest lecturer. Um, the uh, application we wrote uh, is, is on GitHub, if anybody wants to go take a look at it. Um, it's probably woefully over-engineered for the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, but uh, in a way, it's kind of sometimes it's it's like useful to take some simple problem and try to like apply every possible best practice to it, even if it makes no sense, just to kind of see where it leads you. At the end, I left them with the with the feeling I talked about Larry Wall and how he didn't come really from a computer background, he had a linguist background, and and. Uh, the line, you know, like he said, Perl is supposed to be evolving, and, and I told him, I'm really glad that we're bringing new people into the Perl community because you're all going to bring new interesting ideas and you're going to challenge like our you know, probably broken paradigms and hopefully improve it. Perl evolves, it changes, okay? And it's up to the next generation people come in and change it in a way that makes sense. Um, uh, Terry Pratchett, who's one of my favorite authors, he had this, uh, he talked a lot about how like people needed to be involved in a community. He said you need, to, you need to bounce around like he called it a brownie emotion machine of, of, of society in order, to, in order for something to stay fresh and relevant. And I just think like open source is like that. If, it, if the code is not bouncing around like people, like a lot of different people, it's, it's eventually going to like get stale and, and become broken. I think that's why open source is great and almost always is going to win over proprietary applications because you know, unless a company is spending a huge amount of money on something, it's going to be very difficult for them to to keep the code like fresh and relevant and keep bouncing it around. Um, let me give you a little bit of the, the feedback I got from the students. Things that surprised me, they liked the implicit arguments and they liked implicit return. They thought that was cool. Um, they were neutral on the syntax. They didn't have strong negatives or positive feelings about sigils. Um, and uh, they were just fine with it. They weren't like totally in love with it, but I didn't get, I didn't hear like lots of negative stuff either. They appreciated things like CPNM, local lib, and ProBro. They could see that, that those were tools that people had written to help solve problems that they were having learning Perl and using Perl. And they could even, in some cases, see how those were tools that were useful in their companies. Um, Plaque was a big hit. It's just the fact that they could write a web application in a few lines of code. Like, I rewrote a web application together in five lines of code, and they're like thinking, you did that in five lines of code. If I did ten lines of code, it would be twice as good, and it's still only ten lines of code. <laughs> That's amazing. And I didn't have to install anything. It's just a code ref, you know. And they liked Moose. Um, they liked the, the, a lot of the tools. We, um, in the class, when we worked on our application, we, I talked a lot about, like, how you could use attributes and do delegation, not just, not just inheritance, but you could do roles. I talked about delegation. I talked about using roles as like creating an interface. We actually, for our guestbook application, we actually built two back ends. We built one back end that was an in-memory storage, and we built a database back end. And the, we were able to do that with Moose in our application and not have to change any code. It was just a configuration option to switch between the two. And it was easy. And it was something that people who were just learning Perl could understand. So they, it really was a, a major hit. Uh, 
Um, things that were difficult, they did still have trouble installing Perl, and they did bump into problems installing CPA modules. Conceptually, local lib was a little difficult. Um, I, I spent, I probably re-explained it several times in order to fully get it. I know that now Perl Brew uh, can install CPNM and can, uh, it has local lib built into it, so that's definitely going to help. When I taught the class last year, there were separate tools that had to be installed separately, okay, in order to be able to, to get going with it. So that was a little more troublesome for them. Um, I was able to eventually get them, you know, in our application we built a make file to properly manage our, our, our dependencies, and they could use that, and they could see how it could work. But it, it, it was still a little bit more difficult to get off the top. Um, they appreciated that the, the, the duck that the pro community was doing a big better effort at making good documentation and doing things like the modern pro book, which would be free as an EPUB and it's on GitHub. But in comparison to like the learning tools for other languages, it's 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 we still have work to do. It wasn't a criticism; they were just simply pointing out. We see that you know a lot of work has been done, particularly in the last just even one or two years. But we're still not quite there yet with with that. Um, that's just honest feedback. So what would I change about my class if I was going to, to do it again? I'm hoping to do it again this summer. Uh, I don't think I changed the first class. The first class was awesome. I had tremendous fun. And like I, another thing I always tell teachers, if you're going to be a teacher, if you're not enjoying it, the, you know, then either don't teach or teach differently. If you're not enjoying the class, they're not enjoying listening to you, right? So, you know, and I'm going to say don't be nervous and stuff. That's fine. That's like human. But if you're having a bad time, they're definitely having a bad time. So I wouldn't really change the, the class. The second class, I think I should have focused just on getting Perl installed. I did a lot of stuff where I talked about the history of Perl and all that. And at the time, I thought it was valuable. But now I'm thinking back. When I first started programming Perl, I didn't know anything about Perl history. And it wasn't important. Like things, like things that really were tripping them up were like getting Perl installed. And I should have spent the whole class just on that. I ended up spilling over into the third class. And I got tons of emails from my students about the continuing trouble getting getting Perl installed, and I'm glad that enough of them stuck with it. Uh, for the third class, it was really dry um, because I was just like, you know, I was basically just like saying, here's what arrays look like, and here's what hashes look like. I didn't provide like a fun context in which to like learn the things. I just thought it would be like I'd throw them up on the wall and we'd move on. I guess if I was going to do it again, I think I'd probably find a script, like an old script that I wrote that maybe isn't particularly great, but, but had a lot of different stuff in it, and just like go through it and explain how it worked. I need to provide some sort of a, of a build contact. In fact, the fact that I went and for the third class going forward, we, worked, we started building an application together and we stayed with that for the rest of the class was my feeling at the end of this class is that this was just too dry. So something to, to, to think about. I mean, if you're going to be teaching class for an hour and it's going to be just spend some minutes thinking about the material. Um, I could have made better use of social media. My students did email me, but, you know, I don't know. Uh, I could have got the stuff up on GitHub more quickly. I could have, like, done more with Facebook or Twitter or any of those, those things. It would have had an impact beyond our, our, our small group, I think. Uh, the guest lecturer thing was a hit. Um, they, they loved having that. And uh, I would do it again. I would recommend doing even more. In fact, um, following up on the, on the keynote, you know, think about, like, if you're having guest lecturer, maybe, like, you know, have guest lecturers that are not like yourself, you know. So people get different viewpoints. Okay, I have to say system Perl minus minus, man. Like, when I was teaching them how to install Perl, every time they had trouble installing Perl or using CPAN or something, I went over to their computer and looked at it. It was because they weren't doing what I told them to do, which was pretend the system Perl wasn't there. They were trying to short circuit what I was telling them to do, which is install Perl from scratch using Perl Brew and, and do these other things. They're like, I don't really need to do that. I already got Perl installed. I, I'm going to bypass. And then they would get into trouble. You know, it's just the fact that it's there is just like screwing people up. If you teach a class in Perl, you ha just like shout it. Like pretend the system Perl is not there. It's not useful for development. It's there for system use. If you try to short circuit what I'm teaching you here and just use a system Perl and you're going to install like modules into your global directory or install some into global directory and some into your local lib, or, you know, it's going to break and you're going to be unhappy and then you're going to raise your hand and ask me to help you. <laughs> and... You know, anyway, just my rant. Uh, I kind of feel like I probably should have done more handouts and takeaways. I didn't because I'm like, isn't, we're, we're not in the modern age. Do people want paper handouts? I think I probably should have. I should have given them something with, like, 
you know, the URLs and addresses and things written on it, uh, particularly for the people who came to the first class that audited and didn't come back, it would have been great. They, it may have helped them if they wanted to continue to learn on their own. Um, something else that I did, one thing that um, my students said to me was they, they appreciated that the Pro community tried to write modules in the Unix way. In other words, where we try to write small independent modules that are standalone and then try to work with like the idea of standard input and standard output you know, through simple interfaces. Okay? And that as a programmer, your job is to take a bunch of things and put them together into an application. They appreciated that, but they all said it's a little hard. And if you look at like other languages, you know, for example, other frameworks like whether it's Rails or Drupal or somebody, you know, some of the other PHP frameworks, they do give you a bigger stack out of the box. Now, as pro programmers, we also have to stain that and say, well, that big stack is going to eventually get in your way. Okay, okay, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Okay, but the truth is. It would be great that for some simple, basic types of problems that everybody faces, perhaps giving, you know, more Kool-Aid option for learners uh, to be able to do this certain types of things so they could get started, okay? And then make the code not be such a full stack that they can't break it apart and, and then go forward and, and do something else. So I, I wrote a DBS class migration based on my experience with, with teaching. Uh, DBS class migration is a tool uh, that, that works with DBS class and helps create uh, migrations from version, basically versions of your database and also fixture sets. Uh, and it, it integrates with Catalyst and integrates with testing tools. So it, it's kind of a bigger stack than in general we're used to doing. Okay? Um, and I know it's a somewhat controversial concept. Also, I, I, didn't, I didn't just write API-level docs. I wrote a long tutorial, like how to use it from the beginning, how to integrate it with your test cases, how to integrate it with Catalyst, um, just and a big example like that. I did that because my students were giving me the feeling that that's really what they, they wanted more of that. They didn't want Perl to become like Drupal or, or those things. They liked that Perl was independent, and they could see that that's how CPAN is able to scale the way it does because we try to do a lot of small things well rather than try to do one humongous thing, okay? Generally, those huge projects don't fly so well in Perl because we don't get enough stickiness to keep them going, but lots and lots of little projects that are smart and, and work together, they're able to be maintained. Um, so I, this was my stab at trying to cut the difference a little bit um, and, and offer people who wanted to do, like, work with a database and need to work with versioning to give them something that's not as much Kool-Aid as, like, Braille's migrations, active migrations, but maybe more than what you get out of the box with DBX class and some of the other tools, right? This is just something to help get them started. And I'm trying it out, and let's see how it goes, you know. So that was a takeaway that I, I tried to act on. So we're kind of coming to the end here. Um, can somebody dim the lights? Just dim, dim the lights. I'm going to tell a story. Okay. Okay. So, oh. Uh, okay, all right. Fine. Good, good, good enough. That, okay. That's fine. One more time. Okay, anyway. Okay, so not in my current job, but at a previous job, I was in a company that was really psyched about Pearl. And then we were using modern Perl. Like, we were using Catalyst, and we were using Moose. We were using, you know, we were using DBS Class and a lot of other projects that were seen. And we, were, we wrote our application like a CPAY module. We did all those things that you're supposed to do. And we all loved Perl. We thought Perl was great. And I remember my boss was sitting there, and he was on the phone to one of his friends who was not a technology person but wanted to learn programming. He, he was a manager, or she was a manager, I'm not sure, and, and was feeling like they wanted to learn programming so that they could speak better to their programmers, right? They just wanted to, you know, learn enough so that they could be on the same level. And, and that person was asking my boss, like, how can I learn to be, how could I write Perl applications? And I could see, like, the look of anguish on my boss's face was just like, it killed me. Because, and I could feel it too. This year was a Perl newbie, somebody who knew no, very little about programming, but was smart and was involved in technology, wanted to learn Perl, and at that point in time, we did not feel that we could say, yes, here's something you could go do and learn. We just, we just weren't there, you know. I just, 
and it's really, really, really sucked that, you know, he was like, well, I guess you could look at some Python stuff because, you know, because there's tons of documentation for Python. Python focuses on learning. That's, that's just the truth, right? Um, and after you put that on the phone, he's like, that sucked. You know, I, I can't, like, tell somebody that it's easy to learn Perl, you know. Um, and I couldn't disagree with, with him at, at the time. But I, I feel better now. We can turn the lights up. I'll turn them on now. I, I feel better. I think I, we have a lot way to go. Like, we're still in the infancy in, in many ways. But I think it's more hopeful. I, could, I was able to teach a pro class, and I had help. I didn't need to do it on my own. Like, there were resources, right? And there were cool things on CPAN that I could pull out. And there were cool things like, like Plaque and Moose and other tools uh, that I could show them that got the students excited. They, they were like, I could do that in Perl? I can't do that in some other language. Um, and they, like CPAN M, Local Lib, like think tools that were there, like Pro Brew, make it easy to install Perl. They appreciated those things. Like we're, we are now at a place where I could teach a class in Perl, and, and you could teach a class in Perl, and, and not have to just feel like inferior about it. You know, like you could go with it. Questions? Did I talk at all about regular expressions? I did briefly cover regular expressions. I'm not a regular expression foo master, and for the type of problems that we were working on uh, for our application, it wasn't that important um, to be able to do. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't cover it, and there was no specific slight or, or reason not to other than I, I just I felt I didn't have time. Other questions? Go. So, so the question is how to find Perl jobs? No, why is it hard to find Perl jobs and at the same time it's hard to hire Perl jobs? Well, hard to find Perl jobs. We're hiring. <laughs> um, and the flip side of that is um, when your boss says, let's kill Perl and use Java, Ruby, Node.js, PHP, I don't know, whatever, because I can't hire any more Perl programmers. I, I think we should take it seriously. Okay, because I just recognize there are people that know Perl, but the number of people that are all there really good at Perl is probably not as high as we would like to be. So let's just be honest about it. But what I, I try to come back is, is I have two things I come back to is you have to ask yourself, how many pro programmers does the company really need? How many programmers? A hundred? I don't know. Two hundred. Are there not 200 pro programmers in the world that you could say? You know, like really, like they say, it's hard to find. Yes, it's hard to find good programmers in general, and that's how we always say it. But the truth is, you know, like if you think about the numbers, you should be able you know, it's, it's, it's doable. I think it's a, it's a problem also that's getting better because we're doing better advocacy. I see a lot more younger people coming from different backgrounds. Um, I think Perl is more learnable, which is the second comeback. I would, you know, give to my bosses that, like, you know, Perl is more learnable, and people don't have the you know people are, are don't have the same like it's a Duke Nukem of languages anymore kind of thing. Uh, I'm not seeing that as much, so I think it's probably it's it's possible uh, that we can bring in smart people who are good at other languages and bring them over. My understanding is Booking.com does that um, in some cases. So I'm not sure if that's anything from Booking.com that can verify that. No, okay, nobody from Booking.com came to my talk. Oh, you did. So did you? I mean, do you bring in people from other languages and teach them? Do you have like an internal program? Okay, I'm not going to ask you to give away any secrets. I just I wanted to have verification for that. Okay, so they brought in. Okay. So I guess the answer to the question is like getting a Perl job. Okay, um, or hiring pro programmers. I think the community ex understands the frustration, um, but it's possible uh, at, to, if you work at it, bring in smart people. You could do some training education. Pro is not hard to learn. We have tons and tons of learning tools now, um, and it's very it's something that should be doable. Um, in the end, it's, it does come to a decision, um, and I understand that it can be difficult for some companies um, when they have hiring crunches, but I, I think it's a smaller problem than it used to be, and my hope is that if we continue to teach and 
all act like we, you know, how much we act out how we love Pearl. It, I think it, it will get better. Any other questions? So over there. Where did I find my students? Uh, well, I, I work with General Assembly. General Assembly is a, they're an organization in New York uh, that does, uh, this basically is an IT incubator for, there's like a lot of like younger people, people interested in IT, they're in college, you know, they just got out of college, can't get a job. A lot of startups hang out there. It's just like a big, cool open space. Uh, and they do presentations and, uh, you know, they do all sorts of presentations. I approached them and said I wanted to teach a pro class. They advertised for me um, and they got the students to come in. They charged a small fee, like $200 for uh, eight session class. Um, so, uh, you know, just you want to, you don't want to make it totally free because then people don't take it seriously, but you know, it was low. Um, and, uh, in terms of where did, where did my students come from? I actually felt pretty good. I had a diverse group, uh, both demographically and gender wise at the class and at the class. Um, I had some, I had one person, he was a CEO of, um, of a technology company and he said, my company uses PHP, but I wanted to learn some programming because, you know, all of my programmers laugh at me when I'm not around because they think I'm an idiot. You know, so, you know they, that was his motivation. And other people, they, they really wanted to learn Perl because, uh, you know, they were working in companies that use Perl and were hoping to do better at it. We had a couple of people from my company at that class as well. They wanted, they were within our non-development teams that wanted to know Perl better so that they could become, you know, contribute better to the company. But there was a variety of motivations. There was another, yes, go ahead. I was wondering how long was each, how, what was the duration? Each class? Um, each class was two hours, and it was eight classes. So it was 16 hours of teaching, and they paid 200 bucks. So it was a pretty good deal. Uh, it varied. I had a lot of students for the first class because they let people, I think, do the first class for 10 bucks or something. So the first class was about 16 or 17. And the numbers dwind went up and down. They dwindled and, and raised. I think on average I had about, like, about 10 or 11, you know, which is what it is. I would have preferred it had been higher, but it, it wasn't terrible. I hope that it would be more next time. I think part of it was we only advertised the class for three weeks, um, and, uh, you know, it probably could have done more to, to promote it. Were there other questions? Yes? How many of them knew Modern Pearl? How many of them knew Modern Pearl? So, how many of them knew Pearl but not Modern Pearl? Um, so there was one person in the class that was like had been using Perl in a like in sort of an old school system admin capacity, and he was interested in in, in getting a development job. Um, so he knew Perl, but it was like what we would probably call Perl four um, kind of stuff. Uh, and he was really excited. He he was one of the ones that was mostly excited about like like the stuff like Plaque and Moose. He was he had heard of it. He had he had thought that it was hard, you know, and it wasn't. You know, it was, it was easy. Any other questions? Sweet, thank you all very much. And uh, again, I, I promise I'd say it four times. Shutterstock is hiring. If you want to, if you're interested in, in applying, you can talk to myself or any of the other Shutterstock people, of which several are here in this room. Thank you so much. <laughs>